about it for a moment. How many practices are there in the GTA? And how many of you are in this room right now? There's that age old saying, 80% of success is just showing up. And so the fact that we're all here taking time out of our Saturday today, I think that shows that we're all very committed to growing our practices. And uh, I'm really hoping my presentation today can give you some valuable uh, gems of wisdom to do exactly that. What I'd like to talk to all of you today about is how you can become the patient's first choice. How we can really help you stand out in a crowded industry and market strategically. What are we gonna to learn today? I wanna to talk to you a little bit about just some of the trends and some of the challenges we're really seeing in the aesthetic industry right now and what they mean for your practice. I wanna help you guys understand how you can leverage strategic marketing and what exactly that means to really better serve your patients and again, stand out when there's so many other practices offering similar procedures. I wanna make sure you guys understand the real secret to conversion. I know Jeff today is gonna to be talking about a lot of really great online marketing advice for you, but I wanna take that one step further and share how that relates to your brand. Uh, what is a brand anyways on that note, right? So many people think their brand is their logo and that's not exactly the case. So we're gonna go into that in a bit more detail today as well. And I know some of you may already have marketing staff, whether it's in-house, you may have an agency you're retaining to help you out. Maybe you're looking for an agency. I just wanna give you guys some really helpful, concrete kind of action steps you can take, questions to ask when you're looking to work with an agency. How can we get the most out of today? I really want this to be a very interactive 30, 45 minutes with everyone. I like to joke, I'm not television, I'm not Netflix. Please raise a hand, please ask questions. I'm here for you today. Of course, don't let this become shelf help, right? I've done these presentations before. People are like, wow, these are great ideas. These are gonna grow my practice. But then they get back Monday morning, people get busy and everything sits on a shelf. So I hope you guys can find some gems of wisdom today and really implement those into your practice as early as Monday morning. My personal favorite, DK versus DE, or I already know that, I know that already. I've been guilty of saying that myself when I'm at a seminar or in a conference room. And then a mentor kind of challenged me and she said, if you know something, you're using it in your business every single day and seeing results from it. Otherwise, you've only kind of heard about it. So I would love to challenge all of you to, you know, take everything with a bit of an open mind, even if it's something you may already to some extent be implementing in your practice. And let's see how we can take things a step further. Sound good? Quick show of hands. How many of you right now would say the medical aesthetic space is crowded? Yep. More and more practices popping up every day. I wanna share a statistic with you. This is from the ASDS, the American Society of Dermatologic Surgery. In their 2016 customer survey, 50% of patients listed price as their number one factor when they were looking for a provider for an aesthetic procedure. Not location of the practice, not patient outcomes, not the credentials of the provider, price. So that really tells us in another sense, half of all patients are seeing all practices as essentially the same, which we all know they most certainly are not, right? So how did we even get to this place, right? We're in the situation where people almost now are more picky about who their hairstylist is, who's doing their color, than who's doing their medical aesthetic procedures, right? They wanna to talk to friends of their stylists, they wanna create their Instagram, but if you see a Groupon or a sandwich board offering, you know, Botox, $8 a unit, people go running, it's crazy talk, right? So here's how I think and this came to be and who's you know, at fault for the situation, if you will. So the first thing is, we all know this industry is growing rapidly, right? It grows about 12% annually. It's already a $30 billion industry, if not more in 2017. So it's that Kardashian effect, right? Even compared to five years ago, medical aesthetic procedures are no longer a taboo. They've really become much more mainstream. So people are seeing them as that and that's led to commoditization. Um, of course, you know, complacency among providers, right? Five, 10 years ago, you could just throw up a quick website, do a little bit of advertising, boom, you had patients, right? That's not the situation we're in in today's industry. Good is no longer good enough, right? If you really wanna attract patients, if you wanna rise above the noise in this industry, you have to be doing something exceptional. Uh, as far as group buying sites, Groupon, Living Social, irreversible damage to this industry, right? How many of you are dealing with Groupon from your competitors or people who have patients kind of talking about others who offer a lower price? Yep, runs rampant, right? The Groupon effect. So there are ways to mitigate that and that's what we're gonna talk about today. Of course, vendor supplied marketing collateral. One thing I will say is this company, 
does probably some of the best vendor supplied marketing materials I've seen with everything they're doing on social media, body by BTL, it's incredible. But when you're using the same vendor provided materials with nothing else to supplement it that all the other practices with that same technology are using, it really can be something of a challenge and really make it very hard for a patient to see why should I pick your practice over say three or four others in this market that are offering the same device. And finally, um, medical marketing companies, right? There are you know, some of my competitors who mean very well, but their business model is they use templated marketing, templated websites for their clientele. So you see a lot of surgeons, a lot of medical spots website where you know, they've got that airbrushed model at the top, then you know, breast, face, body, skin, kind of four bars below that, then a little doctor bio, and then a contact form, right? We really wanna make sure your marketing, whether it's online or offline, looks distinct. So that's another thing that I think has led to that situation. And it really is a disconnect, right? The disconnect I see in our industry is there are some remarkably talented surgeons, some exceptional providers in this market who are exceptionally talented, but their marketing is what I say devastatingly uninspired, right? Conversely, you have some providers who may or may not do the best quality of work. You know, being a consultant to many practices, I can tell you all kinds of stories. But people who have great marketing, but the patient outcomes really aren't there. It leaves patients dissatisfied, feeling like they got a terrible value, ripped off, if you will. And it ultimately just lowers the standard in the industry as a whole. So you really need to make sure that your marketing, be it online, offline, your branding, everything you're doing really does your practice justice, right? So it leads us to ask, what is really the solution to distinguishing yourself and rising above lackluster marketing? In every industry, there are commodities, right? Cup of coffee, what does a cup of coffee cost you to make at home? A couple cents, if you're using you know, a Keurig machine, maybe a dollar or so for the pod. A white t-shirt if you go to, you know, well not Sears anymore, but if you go to the Bay, maybe $20, $30. I mean, water, water is free, right? Water, H2O is pretty much the biggest commodity out there, right? So we do have commodities. Conversely, in any industry, we have brands, right? So let's compare this. Coffee at Starbucks, four or five dollars, maybe more if you get really fancy with it compared to what you're making for yourself at home, next to nothing. Put a little swoosh on that t-shirt, put a little Ralph Lauren horsey, put my personal favorite, a little Lacoste alligator on there, all of a sudden that $20 t-shirt now is costing you $100 plus. Same t-shirt, more or less. Branding really does have power. It's all about branding, you guys. Again, as we say, branding is really that ultimate strategy to avoid being compared on price, to avoid being shopped around as a commodity. And, you know, like I say, it's why people will choose you over other practices. It's not a matter of just a certain device or a certain injectable. It really is a brand. And this is the one thing that no competitor can take away from you, right? Your pricing, it can be undercut very easily. People can, you know, copy, you know, the look and feel of your practice from a design standpoint. People can even poach your staff. They can sign on with the manufacturer, bring on the same technology. Your practice brand is the one thing that no competitor will ever be able to take away from you or properly duplicate. So it's worth getting it right, it's worth paying very close attention to it, and it's really worth making it something exceptional. What is a brand, right? Again, so many people say, my brand is my logo, or people kind of give me this very vague definition, like, well, you know, it's what you stand for. And those are all parts of it, but ultimately, your brand is gonna be the sum of how prospective and existing patients see, perceive, and experience your practice, right? So it's kind of that real estate you own in the mind of, you know, any particular patient or prospective patient, right? Be it in this industry or elsewhere, we all have brands we know and love. They stand for something to us. We want all of you to have your practices feel that same way to your patient base. Why do people prefer to buy into brands? A couple different reasons, right? They reduce perceived risk. I mean, I know if I am dropped into a new country and I don't know, you know where's a great place to eat, where isn't so great, but I see those golden arches from McDonald's, I'm probably gonna go there. I know to some extent what kind of foods are gonna be on offer on the menu. I know what kind of service I'm gonna be getting, how quick I can expect it, what the quality of food is gonna be. So reducing perceived risk is another one. Um, of course, people more passionately refer to brands they like and trust. Great example I like to reference for this, Apple, right? How many of you in here have an iPhone? Show of hands. Wow, okay, we're a group of Apple people. I am not one of them, but uh, that's cool, uh, right? But how many of you are lining up or know someone who's lining up at the store every September to get the new edition? Maybe there's little tweaks and things like that, but it's pretty much the same phone you already have. But you want it, you wanna tell your friends about it, you want that Apple sticker you can stick on you know, your backpack or whatever, so you have that. 
truly people love Apple, they get passionate about it. Right, you can accelerate your profile through branding, right? You're not just med spa X. All of a sudden, you're not just surgeon Y, Z. You are now known for something in the industry. It's gonna attract media attention. It's gonna just make you that much more well known in your market. So elevating your profile is a big part of that. Um, of course, you can attract more of the patients you want through branding. People will know what you do, what you don't do, the kind of patients you're targeting, and who you're not targeting. An example I love to use for this is, are any of you perhaps familiar with Equinox, the high-end gym? There's one not too far from here. Yeah. Great. Stunning. Stunning. Yeah, I love it there. Yeah, $200. <laughs> if none of you have a membership, like they open till 7 today. After this, go there and just get a walk around so you can feel for it. I'm not joking. They charge $200 a month, of, give or take, you know, taxes in, for a membership. How is that possible when people are, you know, struggling to keep their gyms open, charging, you know, fit for less, $10, $20, $30? Very simple. Equinox knows exactly who their clientele is and who it's not. They don't want the people who are on a budget, and they're unapologetic about it, right? They charge an initiation fee. Things you would think may be very well unheard of, but again, their brand states very clearly who they're going after and they pursue that relentlessly. Um, of course, competitive advantage, that goes without saying. Uh, branding will, you know, of course, uh, when you're ready to sell or transition your practice, an organization, a practice has a strong brand and that intellectual property behind it will always sell for more than a non-branded business. Perfect example from right inside this industry. You may all be familiar with, you know, um, Zeltique, the manufacturer of cool sculpting, right? They recently sold to Allergan for $2.5 billion US. A big part of why that happened is they have built a very strong consumer brand. Now we could have a whole debate here, and I'm sure Josh would love to chime in on what we think of cool sculpting, but the point is they have invested a very substantial amount into building that consumer brand, and that speaks for itself in the value of that sale. Especially given, you know, another company uh, sold for $1.85 billion to Hologic with a full range of devices. So that just kind of speaks in the power of what Zeltik built in their brand. Finally, people buy brands for status. I don't know if you guys can see my belt today, but you know, I love me Louis Vuitton belt, but there's a little bit of status that goes behind that, and we can't deny it, right? So that is something people will buy into. Status doesn't necessarily, by the way, mean you're luxury or high end. That may certainly be the case. But at the same time, status means you're known for something, you've staked that claim in the market, and it's what people want to come to you for. So that's all about branding, it's great, right? But where do we begin? Perfect. So I'm just gonna let you guys take a look at this. You might wanna snapshot with your phones. We call you know, this in our lingo at Branding MD, the distinct practice, right? Things that differentiate commoditized practices from distinguished practices. Things like you know who your best and most profitable patients are and you pursue them relentlessly. Uh, like Jeff will talk about today, you have an effective website and not just a floating brochure with you know, stock photography models. Um, you're positioned differently and you stand for something. All of these are points that really will help you stand out and build a brand. So we're gonna walk through all those in, you know, I've got a limited amount of time, but I'm gonna give you as much detail today as I possibly can. Quickly at a glance, Evaluate your practice, evaluate your competition, right? If you don't know exactly where you stand among your competitors, everything we do through your marketing is literally guessing. So we need to know not only your practice very well, but those of your competitors. That's kind of boring, market research, not ex exactly exciting, but very important step one. Step two, profiling your best patients, and we're gonna talk about that in more detail. Step three, really defining your brand strategy. Again, that, how are you positioned? What do you stand for? All those elements. Uh, fourth, of course, we really need to make sure you have the right message, right? We want to find those words that resonate with your best patients. Number five, uh, again, we need to elevate your visual identity. Probably no more anywhere than in the realm of medical aesthetics do I think visual identity matters. We're in the business of selling looking good. So if your business cards, your brochures, and your patient rack cards, your logo, and your website need work, it really just creates a really big kind of sense of incongruency. So we're going to talk about how you do that. Again, leveraging your practice website is a big part of that. And then attracting patients with strategic marketing using the right channels. So we're gonna talk about that too, so buckle up. <laughs> Step one, evaluate. Like I said, in order to rise above your competition, you need to know what they're doing well, what they're not doing so well, and conversely, what your practice is doing well and where there's maybe some opportunity for your practice. Has anyone here heard of a SWOT analysis? Is that a term anyone who has a business background may be familiar with? Few of people, great. So SWAT, not like SWAT a fly, not like that. It stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So 
something, give it like a quadrant, okay? Strengths are the things you're doing really well in your practice or your competitors are doing really well. Weaknesses are, again, those things you can improve upon both in your practice or if you're looking at a competitor, what they may have an opportunity to improve on. And those are where you can become, you know, really find space to create your advantage. Opportunities and threats, those are things that don't necessarily you know, fall under your direct control, but they will impact either positively or negatively the future prospects of your marketing and your practice. Things like maybe changing demographics in your region, things like new regulations around some of the treatments you're offering. Those would be examples of opportunities and threat. Again, is it fun to do this? Not really, but at the same time, if you don't do this, everything else is guessing. So it really is a very important first step. Profile. So I want to show you guys a quick little video here. Does anyone remember the kind of game you had as a kid, Guess Who, with the blocks and the cartoon characters? I'll show you a fun little video for it. Is it me? Is it you? Who knows? Guess who? Can you guess who with a mystery? Does your person wear a hat? No. You're history. But I'm still here. Can you guess who? Does your person have a beard? Uh-huh. You're out of here. Can you guess who? Do you have a clue? Does your person wear glasses? Yes. I'm gone. Me too. Can you guess who? Not you or you. You're Sam. You win. Let's play again. Can you guess who? Guess who? Game cards do not actually talk. When we look at who your best patients are, that's kind of, in a sense, what we're doing, right? Golden rule of marketing, not everyone will be your patient, right? If you try to be all things to all prospective patients, you're ultimately not going to end up meeting much of anything to anyone. So we really want to define who your best patients are, right? And at the same time, there's kind of two ways you can look at that. Your VIP patients, if you will, right? These are those high-end patients who are coming in, spending without questioning your procedure fees, who are gladly referring their friends, maybe they're posting about you on social media. You know, the kind of people, if you had a practice full of them, you would just be happy as a clam. At the same time, you might have, you know, I call them some learning opportunities. You know, obviously you did your very best for these patients, you're doing great work, but some people are just never happy, right? What common denominators can we find both between your very best patients and those patients you really hope don't come back to your practice and you refer them to a competitor with you know, the most you know, amicable spirit possible, right? So some things you want to look at. Demographics, activities and behaviors, dreams and expectations, decision criteria, and meeting their needs. Now, have any of you heard of the marketing term, a buyer persona? Does that ring a bell for anyone? Okay, cool, I love telling people about this, so this is great. We call it in branding MD lingo, a patient profile. We want to create a picture of all, like we want to give them a name, right? We did one for a client the other week, her name was, you know, Jenny Cathedral. And basically we put all these into a tangible kind of profile of this person and actually put a picture there of what she looks like. And that seems like it's a little much, like why do we need to know so much about our patients, right? Well, it all flows into every other part of building out your brand and your marketing. We want to know who your best patients are. You may not have one type, you may have two or three, but we want to know who these individuals are so, so well that every marketing message we create, be it on your website, in a brochure, every element of your patient experience, it's like they're going for coffee with their best friend, right? That's how well you can speak to their needs. That's how well you can cater the experience to what they're looking for. So that at the end of the day, even if someone does offer a lower price, they don't want to go there because they know their needs are going to be met best by your practice. Then once we know your patients, I mean, how do we really make sure that you stand out and create an experience and a brand they can remember? Well, this is all about your brand strategy. So again, this is me hopping on my soapbox. You, many practice owners will think that, you know, price consciousness and price shopping is just, it comes to the territory. It's part of being in medical aesthetics. The reality of the situation is that's just a symbol of, you know, the fact that your practice probably hasn't done enough to differentiate itself, number one. Number two, you haven't done enough uh, in your patient experience to really showcase and build the value that goes behind your procedure fees. So that's what we want to look at doing together. Theodore Levitt, he is a Harvard marketing professor. He says, there is no such thing as a commodity. Everything can be distinguished. I couldn't agree more with that quote. At the end of the day, you're not just selling, you know, vanquish me. You're not just selling sell your tone. You're not just selling IPL. You're not just selling Botox. What you're really selling is the quality that your experience brings to that. It's selling the overall way your patients are going to be treated in the practice. It's the outcome. It's every element of what makes your practice that your patient can look forward to. That's what you're selling and that's where there's really room to differentiate. 
So what comprises a brand? Again, it is so much more than your logo. If you think of it like a pyramid, there's really three elements. At the base, we have what we call your brand strategy. This is how your brand and your practice are positioned. This is the promise you make. Your brand promise, think of it like, you know, FedEx or Volvo, right? FedEx promises your package is going to be there overnight. That's a promise. Volvo, the safest cars on the road today. That's a promise. What is that one thing your practice can deliver to patients every single time, no matter who they might be or what procedure or treatment they're coming in for? That one thing you can promise them every single time, that's your brand promise. Your brand personality. Think of it almost like a person or a celebrity or maybe an airline, right? What personality do you bring to the table for your patients? Some practices are very fun and contemporary. Some, like many of the ones you'll see here in Yorkville, are much more refined and kind of cater to that, you know, on the exclusivity side of things. Some practices, again, are a lot more modern and trendy, go after millennials on social media. Think of those personality traits you want your practice to convey and make sure you find ways to express that through all of your marketing and even when you're training your staff so people can say, this is what this practice stands for. So that's your brand strategy in a nutshell. Next, we have your brand messaging. So once we know your strategy, how you're positioned, what your promise is, the personality we want to use to convey that, we really need to turn it into words. So these are key messages. Again, those things you'll be saying on your website, in your brochures, in your in-person consults time and time again. Those are your key messages. Your tagline, right? We all know some good taglines. Nike, just do it. De Beers Diamonds, a diamond is forever. That one quick phrase you can use that really helps patients understand what makes you different and what the advantages you offer over other practices are. Some people think it has to be all cutesy and fun. I mean, if you can achieve that, hey, that's great. But more than that, it should just be a very concise way of expressing your advantages and what makes your practice unique. Finally, we have visuals, right? Once we know the strategy, once we know the words that we can use to express that in a concise and compelling way, we need to turn that into a visual identity. That's your logo, that's your business cards, that is your website, that is your patient rack cards, the way your practice is decorated. All of that is your visual identity. Now, I kindly ask you, please don't do what I see so many practices doing and become a me too. The last thing the medical aesthetic industry needs is another logo of a silhouette or a lotus flower, or a face, or a shadow. Very, very common. So look to other industries for inspiration, where you can get you know, your visual identity to look a little bit unique. Maybe it's a high-end fashion brand. Maybe it is a leisure or lifestyle brand. Maybe it's a hotel brand. When it comes to your visual identity, look for examples from outside your industry, other brands that your best patients are buying from and that they enjoy, and see how you can bring those elements into your own visuals so you really do stand out. That's just a little pyramid of how the kind of visual identity strategy and messaging work together. Another part of this experience, and in our workshops with clients when they engage us, we go into full detail, but I just want to give you the basic principle here, patient appreciation. I cannot say enough how many practices don't do a good job of making their patients feel valued, right? I have clients, we're based here in Toronto, but I do business in pretty much every market in North America. The one thing I can say that is unique about this market is how chain dominated it is, right? Lots of chains, they can get clients like it's going out of style. Retaining patients, that's a whole other conversation. A lot of these practices are taking patients for granted. And it really is the little things, whether it's just a handwritten letter, you know, you're thanking them for their procedure, or maybe it's just biannually, you have one of your staff members give them a quick call, not to sell them something, just to say, how are you doing? Is there anything else you wish we offered? How can we make your experience better next time you come in? People like to feel valued, right? It's that old Mary Kay Ash saying. Pretend everyone has that invisible necklace around their neck saying, make me feel important. Just even the smallest measures to do this, whether it is, again, a handwritten letter or a patient appreciation day or some kind of free gift you're giving to your best clients, maybe it's a complimentary upgrade, make your patients feel appreciated, take care of the people who take care of you, and you'll see your practice grow as a result, I assure you. Going back to messaging. As physicians, as providers, you're trained to think in a very clinical way, which is great. But when it translates to marketing, clinical facts don't necessarily translate into something that's gonna resonate and strike an emotional chord with your patients and your prospective patients. Buyer psychology, right guys? 
we all purchase on emotion, make our buying decision based on emotion, and then we justify with facts later. That's like what we just talked about a few moments ago, right? In your consults, we want them to see how they're feeling, really get into that emotional part of it. And then once they realize and resonate with something emotionally, then people will look at things like facts. They'll look at before and after. But ultimately, we need to strike that emotional chord. To use an Estee Lauder quote, she you know, said uh, way back when, I'm not selling lipstick, what I'm selling is hope, right? Very, very powerful. That's a perfect example of what we're going for here. Three angles you really need to consider when you're creating your marketing messages is the patient angle, the practice angle, and the competitive angle, right? Patient, of course, their angle comes first and foremost. What matters to them? What are they hoping to achieve through your procedures? What are some of their concerns and some of their goals as well, right? You also then want to consider the practice angle. What do you want to convey about how you and your staff are different? What do you want to convey that you know, your staff are saying on an ongoing basis that resonates with patients? Bring that right into your messaging, by all means. And of course, the competitive angle. We really want to make sure you're addressing what makes you unique from other practices in your market, whether that is part of you know, the client base you pursue, whether that is a certain part of the way you deliver your experience, maybe it's your location, maybe if you're a more traditional spa that offers some traditional treatments, it's the way you bundle those with your medical aesthetic procedures. So these are all ways we can address how you're different from the competition. Then of course, once we have your messaging, it comes down to visual identity. Like I said, we're in the business of selling beauty, right? If your website is looking a little wonky or a little dated, or you have to do the pinch and scroll on mobile because you haven't done it before mobile trends became a thing, uh, that all kind of doesn't convey the same sense of confidence that a very unique and distinguished principal uh, visual identity would, right? When you have a very strong visual identity, both online and offline, it says, we've invested in our practice. It said, we're here to stay, right? You don't want to be Sally's nails with the clip art and the Vista print business cards. That's really not what we're going for here. Now, kind of tied to your visual identity, and I'll go over this rather succinctly because I know Jeff is going to talk about it in more detail is your website. It really is one of your most key visual identity assets and probably the hub of all your marketing efforts. So just a few things you should all consider. Perfect. So again, mobile responsive, right? The majority of traffic that's coming to your website right now is probably from mobile devices. So if your site isn't easy to use, isn't easy to navigate and giving key information on mobile, you're automatically making it that much more difficult for a patient to want to come in for a consult. That's number one. Number two is, of course, unique design, right? You remember that template I showed you about five, 10 minutes ago? We really want to make sure that your website reflects what your patients want to see, drawing inspiration from not just other med spas and other surgeons, but other industries and other businesses that your best patients are doing business with. You know, I always say you want it to almost look like a work of art, right? You want to see something different. It's almost like a pattern interrupt in the brain, not just another, you know, typical surgeon website with, you know, the glossy stock model and then the four, you know, body part blocks and then the contact form but something different people are intrigued and want to take a look at. Of course, conversion-focused layout, and that's what Jeff's going to be talking all about, but that's things like making sure you have your phone number easily accessible. You probably want an opt-in form so people can join your email database somewhere very visual above, you know, what we call above the fold on your website. So anytime you go to a website, no matter what size monitor you're using, we call this in our industry above the fold. Anything that is before someone has to scroll down on the page, that is what we call above the fold. It's some of the most important real estate you have on your website. Make sure all the key information and calls to action are there. A call to action, again, is that next step you want the prospective patient to take. Whether that is give our office a call, whether that is schedule a consultation. We want to make sure people you know, know what their next step is. Alien proof their website, if you will. Blogging, again, that's another one I wanted to mention. Don't just blog for the sake of search engine optimization. It's very, very important for that. But please make sure your blogging, if you're doing it, really does give tangible value to your prospect. It's something they want to come back and read. You know, I don't know if you're anything like me, but you see what we call you know, these spun articles on some websites where I'm sure it has some SEO value, but it just doesn't add any value to me as a prospective patient. So please make sure you're adding value through your blogs. Next step is attract, right? Next only to what is a brand? Probably the most common question I get from med spa owners, surgeons is how do we market our practice? 
So here's what I see happening, right? Are any of you familiar with art? So on the left, we have a Monet. This is a painting called London Fog. On the right, we have a Mondrian, right? So I always say you really want a Mondrian and not a Monet, right? A Monet, everything's kind of fuzzy. You kind of have an idea what's going on, but not really. There's no firm dates to anything. A lot of practices are just doing stuff, right? Here's what I see so often when someone comes in and we're doing our initial consult. Oh, well, Dr. Mammy's doing Snapchat, so we need to be doing that. And you know, this practice down the road has a really strong referral program, so we copied that too. And I mean, everyone's on Facebook, so you gotta be there. And oh, we're trapped doing this event because you know, the holidays are coming up, but there's no rhyme and reason to anything. So often I see clients and I tell them, your marketing may very well need a make under, right? I would much rather see a practice using four or five marketing channels that they know are gonna work for their best patients, they have metrics so they know they're actually effective, than trying to do 15 things, doing them all half-baked and nothing is really getting traction. So don't think more is better, better is better when it comes to your marketing channels. And that's what you see with a Mondrian, right? Everything has a very firm place, everything's very segmented, you always can see what's happening, very clear, no room for guesswork. There's mass marketing and there's strategic marketing. Mass marketing, a perfect example from just outside the medical aesthetic industry is LASIK MD, right? They have billboards, they have TV ads, they're in magazines, they're everywhere, treating the entire market as one homogeneous group using kind of very much price-driven advertising, right? 490 per eye, it's never 490 per eye, but hey, it gets people in the door, right? So that's mass marketing and that can work if you have you know, multiple cash flow positive locations or a very high marketing budget, great. Maybe then we wanna look at some mass marketing tactics. For most of you in this room, if you're looking to grow an aesthetic practice, we probably wanna focus a little bit more on strategic marketing. This is where we really understand you're gonna have different groups of patients wanting different things and we target them all with the right message using the right channels in the right way. So very, very strategic and not just, you know, I use the analogy, don't have a paintball gun, use a fine tipped paintbrush. Much nicer end result, believe me. Another question I get, and I'm sure Jeff is gonna cringe this, what about SEO? SEO, search engine optimization, making sure you show up highly in the search engines, it is absolutely important. I would never downplay the importance of it. That being said, SEO on its own is not a marketing plan, right? Some marketers use this saying, you don't wanna put a billboard in the desert. I wholeheartedly agree, but I wanna know what's on the billboard, right? When they find your website, then what happens? Is the messaging gonna resonate with them? Is it distinguished in terms of design? Is there something that makes people want to actually come and give your practice a call? Branding and digital marketing work so hand in hand, you really can't have one without the other. So many of you may have digital marketing companies helping you out right now. If you're not seeing the ROI you're looking for, I would challenge you to take a step back, look at your branding, look at your messaging, look at the strategy behind these digital tactics and see where you can really improve that to make sure all the SEO, all the more tactical digital measures you're taking, which again are of the utmost importance, are actually gonna get you the results you're looking for. And that's what conversion is all about. Another thing I wanna mention is high trust media, higher quality patients. And I'll explain what I mean. The one dilemma with digital marketing, even though it's incredibly cost effective if you do it right, and you can reach the greatest, you know, most segmented audience ever if you do it right, it really has a very low barrier to entry, right? Anyone can set up a Facebook ads account, throw up a quick landing page, and boom, you've got an ad campaign going. If you're doing something like planning an event or some print media, well, that has a much higher barrier to entry, meaning cost to it, and people are gonna recognize that. So this is just another little comparison table you might wanna take a snapshot of as well, helping you understand what separates mass marketing from strategic marketing. Uh, in the world of marketing, you can think of mass marketing more like that brand advertising. You can think of strategic marketing a little bit more like direct response advertising. This all sounds well and great, but what does this look like in terms of tactical strategy? You really need to think of your marketing strategy in three elements. For a little acronym, I call it ACE. You wanna ACE your marketing, right? The first phase in your marketing strategy is to attract, right? You need to use all of your different marketing channels, whichever are best for your practice, to drive that traffic. That is, calls to your front desk, people opting in on your website. That's the first step. They go from being an anonymous visitor to a qualified lead. So, great, now you've got their contact information. What do you do with it? Um, and by the way, C and E, convert and engage, a lot of practices miss the mark on that. I'll tell you a story in just a moment. Um, convert. 
that's where we want to use patient education and different avenues to really make sure that we convert them from this random lead to a booked consultation that shows up. And from there, we want to get them on the calendar with a scheduled procedure. So there's different ways we can achieve that, and we're going to talk about that together. Once we have that done, we want to engage your prospective patients and your leads, whether someone says yes to your procedure, whether someone says no, or whether they say that they're unsure and they'll think about it, we want to make sure we don't just let them go off into the, you know, into the sunset, we never hear from them again. We really do want to make sure that we're engaging them in a very specific way, whether that is a current patient or a new patient, to leave you reviews on the appropriate site for your practice and get referrals from their contacts. If they're unsure, great, we can use marketing automation and lead nurturing campaigns to warm them up, give them information they need so they come back in and become a yes. And even if they say no, well, that's fine, but we don't just want to abandon them. We want to follow up gradually on a long-term basis. A quarterly or monthly newsletter via email is a great way to do that. So maybe in six, 12, 18 months, when they are ready to think about that procedure again, or have another procedure on their mind, your practice is the first one they're going to call because they remember you. So this is just a fun little graphic of how all that works together. Again, you want to start with the attract phase, get those calls into your front desk, get those opt-ins on your website. From there, you want to capture their contact information. Then we move right into convert, which first will be for a consultation and will then be for a procedure. Finally, again, no matter what happens in that consult, a yes, an unsure, or a no, we want to make sure we engage them. So I think you guys will love this next slide. People always kind of ooh and awe at it. This is your list of marketing channels for every phase of the marketing plan for attract or convert and engage. Like we talked about a few moments, I beg of you, please do not do all these marketing channels at once ineffectively. Start with maybe three or four channels for attraction, for conversion and engagement. And then once those are mastered, once you have metrics so you know that they're working, then we can move on to adding them to your marketing plan. Now, if you have an internal marketing staff of five people and you know, $10,000 a month to spend on ads, great, let's go for the, uh, you know, more than that. But I would really encourage you to just start small and go from there. Do it right or don't do it is the way I look at it. Not all these practices, you know, not all practices are going to use the same channels, right? We have one client in New York City, they do eight to 12 minutes of live video a day on their Instagram, but they go after millennials in a very big way. Then we have another client in North York who is using a lot of internal marketing to market the aesthetic element of her existing general practice, right? And her clients veer more elderly and they're in a cultural community that's not really big on social media. So we do have an Instagram for her, we do have a Facebook page for her, of course, but we're a lot more subtle there, right? One size does not fit all for marketing. There are many avenues to attract patients. Find those that are gonna be most cost effective and best for your patient base. Um, I do wanna give you a pa uh, one metric you should all be tracking, which is your patient acquisition cost, right? Say you spend $1,000 on a Facebook ad campaign and you get 100 leads. Well, great, so then you know your cost per lead was about $10. So that way, when you take all of your marketing channels and look at your patient acquisition costs, you can see which is lowest and which marketing channel are actually working for you, right? None of this guessing, Dr. Miami's doing it, the other practices are doing it, so we have to too. That is not a strategy. So that kind of wraps up your marketing channels. I do just want to give you some tips here for when you're talking to possible marketing partners or even just evaluating the performance of the you know, marketing staff or agency you already have. Chapter 10 of the book you're all getting talks about this in more detail, but make sure you understand things like who is actually working on your project? Is the executive team going to be devoted to it or are they just pawning you off as an account manager or a junior rep? Um, how unique is your marketing going to be? Are they going to actually do something bespoke for you? Or are they just putting you know, your colors and your logo on a template they've already given 15 other patients, which is incredibly common in this industry, by the way. Um, things like, what value can they bring to the table? What kind of expertise do they have? Can they only help you with a few things? Or can they help you with a very strategic approach, right? If you're working with a company that only does SEO, maybe they're great, and that's great. We don't want to jeopardize that relationship. But is that a comprehensive marketing team? Maybe not, right? It's that saying, when all you have is a hammer or one way you approach marketing, 
every problem looks like a nail, right? So we want to make sure you have a marketing team at your disposal that can handle all of your marketing needs. Whether that is internally mixed with some agency, whether that's an agency that does a comprehensive list of services, whether it's somewhere in between. Just make sure you're addressing things from every angle when it comes to your marketing approaches. Um, and also another thing is, if possible, look for an agency that gives you exclusivity, right? In other words, we don't want you to have a marketing company that hires, you know, you hire, and then they're helping two spas down the street, right? That's really counterproductive. And you have to see, do they have your best interests at heart? So we do offer to varying levels exclusivity to our clients. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just about doing things in their best interest. So that's one thing I'm really adamant about. Another thing that I didn't put on here is make sure you work with a company that understands the Canadian market. If you're working with an aesthetic marketing company based in the United States, and there are some good ones, just make sure they understand how the Canadian market works, right? I have lots of clients in the United States, but I can tell you as a Canadian and with clients here, what works well down south does not necessarily work up here. You can email people in the US like it's going out of style like you can email them every day they'll open everything that does not work up here uh, and of course we have now castle legislation canadian anti-spam legislation it's also a lot more stringent than the spam regulations in the u.s so even though our markets are so similar at the same time they are quite different so that's another tip for you i want to know that you have a copy of all the slides today i'd be happy to send to you I'd also love to give you a copy of a marketing calendar so you can plan out the rest of your 2017. There's just a quick URL you can grab that from if you would like. Again, you just have to enter a quick few details. We'll send that right off to you and you'll be good to go. And of course, as Josh mentioned, you've got my book today. So I think that's going to have a lot of very actionable insights and some great ideas for you. So that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. But thank you so much for your time today, guys. I hope you got some gems of wisdom.